Hola and welcome back. I'm so thankful to those who have watched or listened to the first four episodes of Elevating La Cultura. As I had to rethink how I was going to record the rest of the season because COVID obviously wasn't going away, I shifted to recording our video, video interviews online. And my first online interview was with Luisa, founder of lifestyle brand Mexico in My Pocket. We met through Instagram. I had been following her for years and even using her hashtag, so I was so excited when she reached out to me last year. And from that first Zoom call, we connected instantly. Our stories are so similar and our passion for sharing Mexico's beauty is on the same level. We even have a dog as a pet and the same breed, a Yorkie, which you'll hear a little bit throughout the interview in the background. But I want you to please enjoy my chat with Luisa from Mexico in my pocket. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I know that we have like formed our relationship online like it's always like we've always had our conversations through zoom and we talk all the time on instagram but i'm so excited to introduce you my instagram friend uh luisa who is the founder Aww. of the lifestyle brand mexico in my pocket and you're also a journalist um and we're gonna dive into everything that you do and um just share your story and hopefully that it can relate to someone else and they can be encouraged by what you're doing. I love that. Thank you, Karina. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. I'm really excited to join you today. And yes, it's exciting to dive in a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we just do that? We'll start with who you are. Tell me your story. Tell me all the things. Okay. Um, so my name is, I'll start with my name, it's Luisa Fernanda Navarro, um, and I am originally from Dallas, Texas. Um, my parents are Mexican, I am first generation Mexican American, and I consider myself a Texican. I don't know if people really know what that is, but it's basically someone who's from Texas who's also Mexican, and um, for the longest time I've been very, very, very very proud of my roots. Um, my friends will tell you that one of the first things that I say about myself is that I'm Mexican American, like off the bat, like introduction, like, um, and, but there was a time where I was not proud of that when I was a really little girl, like very little. Um, I would say when I was about four years old, because Spanish was my first language, my mom taught us Spanish and insisted that we learn Spanish first in our household. So we only spoke Spanish in our household. And she sent all four kids to school only speaking Spanish. So we all had a lot of trouble making friends during that time. And in preschool, um, if anything, the teacher actually pulled my mom aside and would tell her that her kids only spoke Spanish and that it was a problem. And my mom was like, yeah, I'm aware uh, that they only speak Spanish and it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, and my mom was right, actually, because I think a lot of times I don't even fault the teachers. They didn't even they were genuinely looking out for us. I think they were worried because you know, it was harder for us to socialize and, and, and connect with younger students. Um, and, but really what my mom was doing was ensuring that we had Spanish language in our home and in our life forever. Um, and at the time I didn't realize she would tell me that it was a gift that I would have, you know, later on in my life and that one day I would be thanking her for it. And I never really saw it that way because, um, it was so difficult for me to make friends when I was little. And I always felt like an outsider and different and strange. And I mean, even little things like just, I always related to the little girl in my big fat Greek wedding when she brought like the moose, moose cock, they would call it moose caca, but it was moussaka. And um, I related to that because I would also bring these not strange meals, but like meals that were part of my culture and other people didn't understand. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a little bit about my story. I think that as a journalist, I struggle in in opening up and, and sharing my own personal story because I'm I'm always I'm always interested in other people's stories, if that makes sense. Um so but I am an open book. Like if you ask me anything, I will tell you straight up. I would say that one of my best and worst qualities is that I'm very genuine and I just say it how it is. 
So that can be good and bad. Um, but for the most part, if you ask me something, I will tell you. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's how we like really connected our first meeting, like oh, when we were over Zoom, because our yeah. stories are so similar. My first language was Spanish and I had to switch into English uh, when I was starting to go to school. So that way I can like relate and talk to the other kids. Um, so yeah, but I think that's so great that your mom was an advocate for you at such a young age and was like, you know what, speaking Spanish isn't bad. 100%. If, you know, I think about, I still to this day think about how different my life would be if I didn't speak Spanish, because one of my biggest passions is actually music and dancing. And I would tell you any day that if I had to listen to Spanish music for the rest of my life or English music, I would every single day. There's something that Spanish music creates. And it's like my mom always used to say when I was little that Luisa like feels the music when she's dancing. And it's so true. Like I feel it. I feel it with the Spanish language. And it's like in your in your soul. And I think that if I didn't I still think that you can I don't think you have to speak Spanish to feel it, but I just I think it's so much better to know what's going like what they're saying. <laughs> Um, so I'm so grateful for that gift that my mom gave me. Yeah, for sure. I definitely can relate to like understanding, even with my kids, like when we listen to music that's in Spanish, I'm always like translating and saying like, this is what they're saying. And I can see that their eyes light up and they're like, oh, now I get it. Now this song, like it, it can be inside of me. Like it can re yeah. like, resonate in my being. Uh, yeah. when you understand it. Um, so yeah. And I also am like you as a photographer, I am more comfortable behind the camera <laughs> than actually being in front of the camera, um, which is similar to what you said, like you want to hear other people's stories rather than sharing your own. Um, yeah, 100%. I think I'm always pushing myself to get in front of the camera because even though I wanted, I, my dream originally was to be a broadcast journalist and, and be in front of the camera, but mostly because I love having conversations with people. And I knew, I thought that was the only way that you, you could do that, but really you could be a producer. You could do, you could do so many things. Um, and you can create your own media platform, which is kind of what I did with Mexico in my pocket. So, so, um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you tell, take us through like what the journey of you becoming a journalist? Okay. So when I was in high school, um, you know, it's funny when I was a little girl, I actually always wanted to be an actress. Um, and I think that had something to do with storytelling and the fact that I became alive when I would sort of perform for my family. And I love, I love making jokes, but I also love, um, I don't know, my family used to joke that I was like so dramatic, but I think it's mostly just storytelling that I've always enjoyed. And I have always loved the movies and I've just always found like dressing up in costumes and I don't know, that kind of life to be really fun, especially when I was a little girl. And then eventually, um, you know, I have two sides. I can be very silly, but I can also be really serious. <laughs> so um, I, you know, I have always been pretty like bookish and I love to read. And I think that's part of the storytelling too, is I, I love to, you know, I, when I was a little girl, I love that I could always just stick my head in a book and kind of escape. If I don't know, something wasn't going great or whatever, I could just go to my room and just read and <laughs> dive into a good story. And um, as I grew older, when I was in high school, my uncle was actually the one who kind of mentioned to me, he was like, you know, I, I really see, he's like, you have a big personality and you love to talk and you love to have discussions. Like, I really see you pursuing some type of journalism career. And, you know, it never really occurred to me because by that point I was like acting. I, I just, it didn't seem like it was something that was going to happen. But um, by the time I was in high school, it was kind of like a great point that made me think about that more. And so I was on the theater um, team at like I did theater in school, but then I quit theater and ended up joining the newspaper. 
Um, and I was actually older by then because like I was a junior and you had to start as a freshman. So I ended up writing with all of the freshmen. <laughs> like I didn't care. I was like, whatever, I'll just like go back and and um and slowly but surely that was when I really fell in love with storytelling and I really put myself out there by I wrote columns, um, like personal stories, and then I also wrote just like regular stories for um the newspaper. And then whenever I do something, I really just go all in. So I was so determined that um, by the time I, you know, I ended up, I went to college and that's where I really was like, okay, if I'm going to pursue this, I'm going to do all of these internships. I'm going to write for all the newspapers at school. And um, so, yeah, I mean, (laughs) that's just a little snippet of my journey. I like that like it was, it's usually like one, um, like one pivot point or like how you said your uncle made that comment saying like, Hey, maybe you would be a great storyteller or like go in this direction and how that one person or that one experience can like shift and like kind of direct your whole life and as you like start gaining passion for that like you realize like okay well now I can do something with this like being that you went to uh college for for journalism like that has led you to want to like build this platform with Mexico in my pocket um so why why don't you talk a little bit about the bridge how uh your foot in journalism, Mm -hmm. like launched your desire to start Mexico in my pocket? Um, Okay, so basically, I had been working in news. um, When I was in college, I did, I think it was like, don't quote me on this, but eight internships in college. So I started my freshman year, I worked for Univision in Dallas. And I actually wrote a paper on immigration that got me that job. And I really love this story. Because um, when I wrote that paper on immigration, I was always kind of passionate about that topic, I think, as a Mexican American, and having known a a lot of undocumented people, but also people who weren't undocumented. Um, So I knew like both sides of it, if that makes sense. So I pursued a paper on that topic and interviewed a bunch of people from both sides of the aisle. What was interesting was that it was a sociology paper that I wrote and I ended up getting a C plus on it. And I was like, I was like devastated. I was so devastated that I, I mean, I was that kid, like, I'm not going to lie. I, I really took that to heart. Like, I was like, what do you mean? Like, it's a C plus, like, I'm going to die. Like, it was so dramatic in my head. Um, And eventually, actually, I was telling my mom, because like I said, I'm always such a go getter. And I was like, Mom, I need like, I went home for the summer or something. And I was like, Mom, I really want to pursue journalism. It's really competitive. Like, it's really impossible to even get an internship in news. So I need to start now. And I was a freshman. And most freshmen, I think it might be different now. But at that time, most freshmen didn't really pursue internships yet. They kind of do it more junior year. So um, it was kind of, I wouldn't say it was unheard of, but it was definitely not the norm. So um, we actually like ended up driving to Univision that day. Like my mom drove me there and she was like, okay, no, this is not how we should do this. Like, this is strange and bizarre. (laughs) But I was like that determined. I was like, mom, drive me to Univision. Like we are going, um, and for and, people who might not know, I mean, I grew up watching Louis Vuitton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. It's like the Mexican channel. Yeah. Like one of the, they do, um, I, I don't know. I grew up watching the news there. I would watch like all of the like novelas that. No that shows, yeah. 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 Univision is it. Like besides Telemundo, like Univision yeah. is the channel. Like I went to my grandparents and Univision was always on. Um Univision was always on in my house too, even I, that's where I would watch the telenovelas when I was little and I wasn't supposed to. Um, I love telenovelas. Me too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
And yeah, so it was a big deal to get this inter internship with Channel 23. Like in Dallas, yeah. it's Channel 23. Like I grew up with Channel 23. So I was like, oh my God, like I'm working for Univision. And so, yeah, so anyway, long story short, I did end up getting a meeting with them and I told them about my paper. I like showed it to them. And that's what actually piqued their interest during the interview. They were like, wow, this is really good work. So I guess the moral of that story is that writing and, 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 and journalism and well, journalism's factual, but you know, writing and, and creativity is so subjective sometimes. So for instance, my teacher hated this paper and God knows why, maybe it was like for political reasons or whatever, but it was well done. It wasn't, you couldn't argue that like the paper was well done. It was well researched. It was well, what, I, you know, like from a journalism standpoint, I was relying on one person's opinion of my, writing or my piece right and then it opened the door for me somewhere somewhere big somewhere like it was my first it was my first break it was my big break that I finally got and I was like oh my god I'm doing this I'm gonna work in the news <laughs> so um so yeah so from there I ended up um keeping on applying to tons of internships I worked my butt off and um I would say that while most of my friends would be like partying on Tuesday nights or something. I'm not going to lie. I was in the library, even like Friday nights because I wanted it so bad. And I think too, I always had my dad in the back of my head because my dad is a, um, an immigrant and, um, he never had anything handed to him. He was one of, he is one of, um, I think se seven children, one of, one of them sadly passed away when he was little. So it was like one of, I always have one of eight in my head. Um, but anyway, yeah, so he's one of, he's the oldest of seven and he immigrated to the United States and he um, worked as an orthodontist and nothing was handed to him, like nothing. I mean, he has a thick accent and um, he has been judged and he's gone through it all, right? Like all of our parents and, um, or many of our parents. <laughs> um, and I think like, I'll never forget when he dropped me off at Boston College and he said to me, I, I would have killed to, to go to, to this school when I was younger. This is, this is so amazing. And like, I remember it like almost brought tears to my eyes. Like just, I don't know, just like hearing, like, it's so true. He would have killed to go to that school. So I was like, I'm not gonna like take this opportunity for granted. I'm going to really like milk it like I'm gonna like take advantage and it was my dream to go to Boston College I got into like my dream school like um you know I had teachers who said I wouldn't get in and and all this stuff but that was my reach like for some people it was like their safety that was my reach and so when I got there I was like I'm going to I'm not gonna take it for granted I'm gonna work my butt off <laughs> I feel like this, like, I have a similar situation. My father is yeah. an immigrant. And when I went to college, I gave it 110% um, because it was such a, an honor for, for my family, for me to continue higher level education. Um, but I, I want to go back and talk a little bit more about your paper and maybe... Uh, the experiences that you had in college, like, mm -hmm. because I heard you say that, I don't know if maybe I got a C because there was some political difference or mm -hmm. if, or what you just said, um, people said that you wouldn't get in. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that had anything to do with who you are and the fact that you are a pers person of color, that you're Mexican American? So I think when I was really little, when I was like four years old, I struggled so much harder with this idea of racism. And I think it shaped me and my identity for the rest of my life because I knew what racism was at four. And I think that's very strange. Like I look back on that and I'm like, that is so strange that the world around me, like it wasn't like I was born and I was like, I don't, I'm embarrassed to be Mexican. It was the world around me that made me feel that way, if that makes sense, because they were telling me that it was strange to speak Spanish. They were telling me that it was strange to eat the kind of food I did, or they were saying really horrible things to me. Um, 
Now I want to set the record straight. Not everyone is like that. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, um, but I think that being presented with that kind of information at such a young age shaped me for the rest of my life. Luckily, I had amazing parents and amazing grandparents and elders around me that supported me and showed me like that my culture is so valuable and that that's just ignorance. Like it's not, you know, it's not correct at all. Um, but I would say, <laughs> You know, it's interesting. Um, I would say, yes, I would say that for sure with that sociology paper, I think that guy had bias. I really do. Because at the end of the day, he could have corrected the paper in a much different way. He said something like, he, he said that like, I was not correct in my ideas. And that to me missed the point. Because if he had told me that... Um, and they weren't even ideas. It was it was really actually I interviewed both as a journalist because I love journalism. I interviewed both sides of the aisle in that paper. And I think he just didn't like that in the end, the case was that and I'm just going to I don't want to go down this tangent, but um, I made the argument in the paper that there is a huge immigration um there's a huge issue with our immigration system in the United States, that it's very difficult to immigrate here. Mm -hmm. And I figured that out from doing this research paper. Like I, I was actually asking this question in a naive way as a journalist and saying, okay, let's give this a shot. Let's figure this out. Yeah. And that's what I discovered in my, in my research. And so he didn't necessarily agree with that. Um, and he pretty much told me that. And I was, I was pretty upset and I knew I took a risk in writing that paper. I knew I did. I, I, I do that. I, I pushed the, I pushed the barrier, but I was like, but, but isn't that what life is about? Life's so short. Like if I don't do that, like, then what's the point, you know? So, um, so yeah, I think in that instance, yes. I think in when the woman said that I wouldn't get into Boston college, I also think yes, but I also had an amazing ally who said that I could. And so I don't know, it's just, it's very interesting. And so I try to focus on the positives. I think if you look at Mexico in my pocket, I think it's a platform rooted in a lot of positivity. So I took all that negativity and I did the opposite. You know, um, I don't like to dwell on the negativity, but it's important to talk about for sure. You can't ignore it. Yeah, I feel like whenever someone tells me I can't do something, then that's like, <laughs> Well, I'm going to show the best you. Thing. Yes. Oh, I love it. Oh, it's, it's, it's the reason I've done anything, actually, I think. Yeah. I get so ticked off when someone says that. It's the best. Like, I'm like, oh, thanks. Like, you just motivated me even more. <laughs> I know. I was like, well, now I'm going to find a way. Let's yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. So let's talk about Mexico in my pocket. When, okay. when did you start it? Why did you start it? Tell me about like the beginning of it. Okay, so Mexico in My Pocket started five years ago in October. So we're in 2020. So it was 2015. And, um, you know, I started Mexico in My Pocket because for multiple reasons. Um, I started it one because I was frustrated in the news world. I was frustrated with the way Mexico was represented. I was just so sick of it and it's been my whole life like it's so funny but I don't know why but it I guess uh, I'm 30 now so at 25 I was like enough like I was like I'm putting my foot down I was like Louisa you need to stop complaining and you need to do something because I think that oftentimes in our lives we're always just explaining like something that's frustrating and we don't actually do anything about it and so I was always kind of talking about like I wish there was this platform and I wish there was this and I wish, and I was, I kept saying, I wish. And then I was like, why don't you just create it? Like, what is, <laughs> you know, like, why are you saying I wish like you have the ability? So, um, and then the second thing was I actually went to Mexico um, for the first time in a very long time. I think it had been seven years, which is like, that's like unheard of in my family because I went every summer growing up when I was a little girl to see my grandma. Like we would stay with her for like a month in Saltillo. And um, we actually hadn't gone because uh, it's it really sad, but because of the 
drug war. Um, it was getting like really dangerous. And, and then also I was in college and so it got really difficult, um, with like, it just, things like got really difficult to go there. And, um, so it'd been a very long time and I surprised my grandma for her birthday. <laughs> and, um, it was like one of the best moments of our lives. Like my little sister and I, we surprised her and she was like screaming, crying. Like she couldn't believe it. Cause we hadn't been there in like such a long time. And like, she was so used to us going every year, you know? And I remember we had only, I think we were there for a week. It wasn't very long cause we were very busy. And, um, it's funny how we get older and we get busier. Like, I'm just thinking about like, and like, it's just they get crazier. But, um, so anyway, we were there for a week and on the very last day I was sitting in her living room. I'll never forget it. That's where Mexico, my pocket was born. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was so sad. I was like, I'm leaving. And I just started like, I started looking at all of her decor and she has this beautiful room with like, it's just so Mexican. It's so beautiful. And so it's something that I've always wanted to show people, but I haven't really been able to like, it's the Mexico that I always talk to people about, but they don't get to see it in the media. Right. So I was sitting there in that living room and I was so sad. And my grandma is always telling me that I need to travel to Chiapas and then I need to travel to Guanajuato and Oaxaca. And I've been to Oaxaca and I've been to a lot of amazing places, but like the way she says it is, is, is as if like, I'm this millionaire with like, like, yeah. Oh, okay. Like, let me just get my private jet and like, let's go. Like, I mean, she's right. I do need to go to these places and um, I, I have a plan to do that. But when I was 25, like, that's when I was like, I was like not making any money in the news. Like, um, it was in the beginning, like I could barely, I mean, my mom paid for like that trip to Mexico. Like, um, it was, I remember like my adventure in life was like make, I would like cook tortilla soup or like I would cook at home. Like that was like, that was it for me in Queens, like in my little studio apartment next to the airport in Queens. And that was like it. Like, I was like, yes, like I'm going to make tortilla soup tonight. Like that was like my Friday night at home. So That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So like, I was not going to be traveling. I, I mean, I had a goal. I was like, okay, later, like once I, you know, keep climbing the ladder, but anyway, so, so I decided in that moment, I was like, I know a lot about Instagram because as a journalist, I actually set myself apart as a young journalist by util utilizing social media to pursue and break news stories. So when I was in the newsroom and I was like this little 23 year old or 24 year old, I would break news stories using Twitter. <laughs> and the producers would be like, how did she get this information so quickly? And I would like call the police and like confirm with the police or like send it to the executive producers. And they would be like, what the hell? Like, they'd be like, how did she get this? And I would use social media and I would talk to people on social media. I still do it today. Yeah. Um, and so I used social media. Um, I knew how to do it. And so then I decided in that moment, I was like, you know what? I want to show people the beauty of Mexico through social media because I don't have money to travel. I was like, I can do this. Like it was one of those things where it's like what we talk about, where it's like there, where there's a will, there's a way. Like, it's not like, why am I making excuses? Like, why am I like, there's always a way. And I think my dad always taught me that as an immigrant is like, there's always a way if you want to do it, you can do it. So I realized I was like, you know what, I'm going to make an Instagram. I'm going to reach out to people just like I do in the news. And I'm going to ask them for permission. Like, Hey, you're in Guanajuato. I love this picture of you in Guanajuato or this picture that you photographed. Can I regram you with credit so that we can show people the beauty of Mexico? And I started with zero followers and a lot of people thought I was a weirdo and didn't even <laughs> Want to like, like they were like, who is this? And my account wasn't even Mexico in my pocket. It was Mexico, and it was like M three E's, X three I's, and then C three O's. And oh it was until later on that was my mom was like, I can't find your account. What is it? Like I can't like. So then I had to like brainstorm a new name, and um. But that's how Mexico in my pocket started. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And how many followers now do you have? I mean, it's grown like so much. Yeah, it's grown. It's grown. Um, we have 30,000 followers. Um, 
And it's so funny because I always say we because I love to like fake it till we make it, but it's me. Like, <laughs> there's no one else here. Like, it's literally me. But I'm always like saying we because I want to put in my mind, you know how you like um, can manifest something? Like, that's what I'm doing. I'm like, one day we're going to have a team. So we, I'm like, we. <laughs> yes, girl, I do the same thing. I'm always like, we, we're launching this. Yeah. We're doing this. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because in my mind too, Mexico in my pocket is a we. It is because it's a community. And without the community, there would be no Mexico in my pocket. But in, and the reason I love that is because that's the same with Mexican culture. If you think about it, like, as a, I'm very proud to be Mexican and American. Mexico is a very collective community. Ven a la mesa, let's eat. Like, yeah. it's just different. And so that's why I love Mexico in my pocket as a community. It's not about me. It's not about any, it's about all of us. Like, it's our culture. It's not my culture, you know? So. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, and that's actually how we connected is I was looking and I was using the hashtag Mexico in my pocket. And so yeah. I feel like I would always use it because I was posting pictures when I was in Mexico. I was p- posting pictures of Mexico. And um, yeah, I think that's how maybe I got on your radar because I feel like you reached out to me. And when you were- Yeah, I reached out to you. Yeah. And I reach out to people. Yeah. Like I did that in the news, like all the time. I DM people all the time, you know, yeah. I'm not, you know, it's funny cause I'm shy in certain ways, but I'm not shy in that way. Like I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone. Yeah. And it's so funny that you say like, it's just me, even though I say we, um, <laughs> because when you first reached out to me, I'm just like, oh my goodness, this huge brand is like <laughs> reaching out to me. And I'm like, oh. wait, no, I don't believe you <laughs> for real. Um, and so then when we first got, no, I me. thought it was, I don't know, you know how some people have like yeah. media managers. I wasn't sure. I was like, yeah. I don't even know who this is reaching out, but it's a brand. Yeah. I'm going to say yes. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. So, and I feel like that first meeting, like that's why we connected. Not only are our stories so similar, but we're both yeah. like just us trying to yeah. make something that's bigger than ourselves and to include like so much more people into our vision in what we're building. Uh, So, so yeah. So tell me how it's grown. And I know that this year you have done a lot to like pour into it. And I am just so proud of everything you like put out. I'm just like, Oh my goodness. Yes. This is like, you're um, you're actually like bringing people together from all yeah. over the country all over the world even yeah um, yeah so yeah so talk a little bit about that okay so um you know it, I think like I actually took a break from Mexico in my pocket for like two years just so people are aware and I guess the reason I say that too is like it's okay to take a break and it's okay to kind of figure yourself out and so I did take a little bit of a break but ironically it was because of COVID that I was able to grow it so much more this year. And the reason was, is I got furloughed from my job. So what I did was um, I was furloughed, I think, I think I had like 24 hours of work a week. So I used the other hours that I wasn't working to use Mexico in my pocket, like it was a full time job to see if I could do it. I was like, is there enough work? Is there enough work with this thing that I really want to build and that I've always dreamed of making my full time job? And I realized that there is so much work during that um, that period where I was furloughed. And I also realized that I loved it and that I could do this like I could do this all the time and I, I will never get sick of it because it's so much bigger, like I said, than us. It's so much it's there's such a big mission there. And I would say that this year um, we have grown in ways that I never dreamed of. Um, you know, it all started with this little marranito when we created the online shop. And a marranito is a little pig, for those of you who don't know. And it's a little pig clay vase that um, I posted one day on our Instagram because I liked it. I just post stuff I like. <laughs> and I also post stuff like it's funny when I say we because it's really me. And 
I just post stuff I like. I post stuff that I feel. I post stuff that I connect with from my culture. And um, I also sometimes like if I'm posting a quote where it's like, okay, it seems like, you know, if I'm trying to like lift you up because of a bad day, like I'm actually doing that for me sometimes. (laughs) Like I love quotes. I'm so cheesy. I'm so cheesy. I'll admit. But like, it's also just me like I'm like well today was a bad day maybe someone else had a bad day I'm gonna post a quote yeah so we started with um I posted a marranito it was a little clay vase and um I'm actually looking at it right now and it went viral I always like to post other brands because I want to I want to help like support our brands if that makes sense like you know in our community so I love to regram like I you know I'm and I don't care if you're a shop I don't care if you're a photographer like I just want to support So I posted this marranito on our Instagram and it went so viral that people from our community were DMing Casa Paz to order it. And that made me really happy. I was like, great, that's awesome. The problem was Casa Paz didn't have the ability to, they didn't have a website and then they didn't have like, their payment platform was strange because it was Mexico, like it was through Mexico. So it seemed sketchy, but it wasn't sketchy. And like it wasn't like oh paypal them or like it wasn't that right so they're trying to connect with an american audience and it just wasn't as simple for the american audience so then the american audience is like reaching out to me and i'm like i have nothing to do with them like i just posted this and so then long story short i think we started by working like on an affiliate basis and then the affiliate basis really didn't make sense and so eventually I proposed to them I was like why don't we just collaborate why don't we just why don't I create the website because I have some web design experience and I'm not like a professional or anything but like I've done it before (laughs) and um and I was like I'll create a website and I'll have some other products and I'll have the marranito on there so people can check out and we'll do a commission-based type you know business model or something and it ended up working really well in their favor and um yeah, sh- sure enough, like we were selling these, um, we were selling these marranitos, like, like hotcakes, like people just love them. Um, there was obviously issues with it because there's always issues, but like some of, some of them would come shattered and we finally figured out how to maneuver that. But that was really stressful because they're made of clay and they're really fragile. And so at first, like we were selling them, but then we ended up, um, we didn't even really end up making any money on them because we were having to return. We were having to like, uh, what is it called? Like replace them (laughs) because they were coming shattered. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the reason I share that is like, I'm very transparent, but also, um, I don't know. I just think it's so important to share stuff like that because if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this, like these things happen, like this is the reality of entrepreneurship. Like you might see an Instagram, like, people getting their package and it's all perfect and all of this stuff. But like every day I'm dealing with something new and every day I am trying to make our customers and our community happy, you know? So it's been interesting. Um, So yeah, so we started an online shop and from there we also launched a cooking class, some cooking classes. And honestly, I can't even believe how big our website is now. Like I can't even believe all the products we have on there. I can't even believe like when you and I collaborated, like I remember we were struggling to just get photography on there. Remember? Like it was just, and like, I didn't even know how we were going to do it to be honest. And I think it's been such a huge learning lesson for me that I just keep going and I just keep moving and slowly, but surely it figures itself out and you make mistakes and it sucks. (laughs) And it's like, And it makes you feel that heart racing pain where you're like going to have an anxiety attack over it, but you just get through it. And it's like slowly, but surely it figures itself out. Yeah. I feel like that's what I always like advise people who are wanting to do business. Like I, I never have advised anyone to like quit your job and just start something because you have like those, unexpected expenses and you might need to replace something plus you have to pay for like a website and like things that you wouldn't even think to pay for like you have to pay for like shipping and like the stickers that you want to put on the packages and it all costs money 
Um, and at the same time, yeah. I feel like all the things that might go wrong could be super discouraging and super because you're building something from your heart. Like it could be, it's that much more like painful when something goes wrong, which is why you have to have like that foundation, like that reason has to be so strong. I 100% agree because, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've been thinking a lot about this and I have started another company in the past and even like there got, there was a point in the news where I got to a point where I was like, I don't even like this anymore. And when I, when I started, I loved it. Like I would have woken up at three in the morning. I would have done whatever it took to get there and all of that with Mexico in my pocket. I will do Mexico in my pocket, even if it doesn't bring in revenue. Like I love it so much and I will fight for it. And I will, because it's not just about me. It's about, it's so much bigger. It's so much bigger. Um, and you know, it's so weird how life works because I did go through a bit of a phase like last year where I didn't understand my purpose and I got so down and I like almost was like being mean to myself where I was just like, like you are worthless, like basically to myself. And it took that to like understand, like to get here. You know what I mean? I think you see all the beauty and all the, you know, the good stuff. And it's like, no, like <laughs> there have been some dark times <laughs> behind this platform that I don't share because that's not, we're here to, we're here to, um, to elevate people and like excite them. And like, um, maybe elevate's not the right word, but, um, to like bring up like the positivity, you know what I mean? And, um, and I don't, and look, it's good to show reality. I try to show, I try to come on with no makeup. I try to be real. Like I burnt the rice and all of that. I think that's very important, right? Like, I think there's a good element to that, but I also don't want to like depress people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like a good mixture. Yeah, no, I love how honest and real you are. And it's so funny because I was on that, class when you did burn the rice or when no um I was watching you when you were like like following your stories when you said you burned the rice oh, or right. burnt the beans and I was like oh my goodness that was me like when I first started cooking Mexican food yeah. but yeah like there's all all like food is such a huge part of Mexican culture um and any culture really like food is and yeah. it was such a shame thing for me to not know how to make basic Mexican meals and like to have yeah. to call my mom and say like, how do I do this again? How do you like, yeah. what do you put in the beans? Like, how do you make beans? Like, it's such a simple dish. Um, and they shame you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I feel like it's so refreshing to like relate to someone else who is like... I know I'm not alone. It's not just me that's burning this and that uh, oh, no. or Trust adding me. too much of this uh, yeah. or like in that class, like opening the lid of the rice yeah. and mixing it. And I was like, oh, I do that all the time. I didn't know it was. Um, no, uh, I know. I um, I didn't even know how to use. We did a class with Eliseo. Um, who's amazing, the baker and from Mexico city. And I know you take his classes too. I didn't even know how to use my KitchenAid mixer. Like, I'm not going to lie, but that's what it's about is like, I think that's what I try to show people is like, we have such a love for our culture and you have to start somewhere. Like our grandmas and our moms also had those moments, you know, they weren't just these perfect cooks. And so I'm really working hard so that I can pass these traditions on to future generations in our family. And um, cause one day I will have kids and I want them to experience what I experienced. Um, I know it'll be a different experience, but I'm gonna do my best to show them as true and authentic as I can to like what my Tita Susana and my Tita Lupita and my mom and all these people showed me. Yeah, um, that's great. I love what you built with Mexico in my pocket. It has like grown mm -hmm. immensely just over the past like six months or so since I've met you. Um, and for anyone listening, if you haven't checked out Mexico in my pocket, you definitely need to. Uh, yeah. We'll tag all of the places where you can find uh, in the show notes, and then you can tell everyone where to find you at the end. Um, but I want to talk about what is the most inspiring feedback that you've received from other people that have helped you along the way? 
So I think something that something that people don't really realize is that even though my grandmothers are the inspiration behind the platform um, and are, um, are a major like, um, you know, I've dedicated the platform to them, to my grandmothers, my mom plays a major role in all of this. And um, maybe not so much in like dictating what I do or how I do it, but um She's been along for the journey, just like when she drove me to Univision when I was younger. Um, and she's always, she's always um, basically supported me in any of my dreams, even when they seemed really crazy. Um, but that being said, she's also always been really honest and real with me. So for instance, um, <laughs> like we have very different personalities, my mom and I. Um, we have similarities, but very different. And so when I all of a sudden showed up and was cooking her rice on Instagram stories, I think she was shocked. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? Like, how, why are you doing this? Like, how can you do that? Like, she would have like had a heart attack before doing something like that. She's like, there's all these bloggers on there. Like, how could you show up and just cook rice? Like you're some like professional. And I'm like, well, I'm not. And, um, but I think that even though she was mortified by that, whole thing I think that she has always encouraged me to be myself a hundred percent and to be the Luisa that she loves and the Luisa that is very genuine and real and authentic like even though she probably has to have everything perfect into a certain way she also has always taught me to be okay with the fact that like not everything is perfect um because sometimes I think that I am kind of hard on myself and I I wish I was more like that, but she's taught me to fall in love with the fact that I'm not like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, so that's been really good advice because when I'm hard on myself, I think about the fact that um, that it's okay to just be yourself. <laughs> yeah. And um, from my community, recently I received really great feedback and advice, and this is more technical in business, but um, we had a situation where unfortunately a lot of our products take time to get delivered because um, they're coming from Mexico and we're working really hard on doing a faster turnaround time. Um, but one of our clients was like, it's a long story, but basically I had told her that the product would be delivered in a week and there was a delay. There was an, another significant delay and I dropped the ball and I hadn't updated her. Like, even though on the website, it said like all of this information and all of that, like I told her that I would update her and I didn't. And so her advice recently has been so, so useful to me because now, um, even though I'm a really, I actually pride myself in being a really good communicator. I was kind of dropping the ball in terms of like following up. Um, and so now I am like, I'm like checking in on everyone, like to a point where it's like, did you, were you able to get the link for the cookie class? Like, even if I see that it went through, I just want to double check. And so that's been really useful business advice because, and then actually she like became like a forever customer. Like she was like, I, I love that you guys like owned up to this and, and, and now we have like a really great relationship. So I always appreciate feedback. So like, even though sometimes it hurts and it's like hard to take in, I am like, tell me your feedback. Like I want to know so that I can improve. Yeah, that is so great. I feel like sometimes we, as humans like might take feedback personally and think like it's the end of the world if someone is upset or frustrated um but I tell my kids all the time too like you're gonna mess up you're gonna make a mistake it's what you do after that's gonna matter all right so last thing what's a piece of it encouragement or advice that you'd give to the next generation so I think that we live in a very strange time where unfortunately the younger generation, good and bad, they, they were sort of born into technology and they were born into this social media and they were born into this like fake reality where we publish everything online. And I think that even regardless of the fact that I wasn't born into that, um, I think that society always kind of dictates how you should act and how you should portray yourself and all of that. So I want to give the future generations, I want to tell them to um, 
even when it's scary and it, when it feels very uncomfortable, to always give yourself that inner voice and tell yourself like, hey, we're going to do, we're going to always be ourselves and we're always going to present like our true self, um, even if it's like scary and we'll do this little thing today to just get to that bigger like um, true self um, every day. I, I know that sounds so strange, but I think what I'm really trying to say is like, for example, when I, <laughs> when I first started Mexico in my pocket, I didn't show up at all on camera because I was horrified of the idea of being like, hello, it's me. Like, also, it wasn't about me. And um, I think that now I've realized how important it is to push myself to at least introduce myself and say hello, because I am, I am in charge of this platform. I am in charge of, you know, and so every day when I try to get on camera, I, I am pushing myself even like, I'm like, I know there's going to be critics, but I'm like, okay, like I have an inner voice. that's like, we say you can do this. And so just be kind to yourself and have your inner voice and just know that you are, you are your best friend. Yeah, that's, that is great advice. I feel like oh, <laughs> we can get so caught up into, in social media and being so, so self-conscious and so afraid of negative feedback that yeah. it limits us and like our, our uh, full potential and the impact that we can be making. Um, so yeah, so that's great advice. Anyway, I have le like loved having you on and being able to talk about all the things from uh, start to finish of who you are. And um, I just want to thank you for your time and for sharing as much as you did. I know that it's going to be able like be relatable to other people and hopefully encourage someone else that they can they can do something with their their lives their passion their potential as well uh, before we end tell people everywhere that they can find you um okay so we are um mexico in my pocket are the four magic words for us so you can find us at mexico in my in my pocket .com, at mexico in my pocket on instagram at mexico in my pocket on pinterest facebook at Mexico in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's easy. And yeah. once you find your way to Mexico in my pocket, you have to subscribe to the newsletter. Oh, yes. You have to subscribe to the newsletter because that's really where the party at, party is. Um, that's where you get all the freebies, all the free cooking classes. If we ever give out free stickers. Um, honestly, it's all about the newsletter. Um, so definitely subscribe. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. And one thing that you have recently done that I love is the gifts on Instagram. Oh, yeah. And so if you, yeah. uh, for stories, like if you want to search uh, or to have like curated Mexico in my pocket gifts, just search yeah. Mexico in my pocket in the gifts. Uh, yeah, but. we have, um, we recently have some Dia de Muertos gifts that I'm very proud of that Arturo Canseco from Oaxaca created for us. He's a very talented artist. And um, we also worked with Angelina Klein, who created some Spanish language gifts for us. And um, yeah, we're always working to kind of just get more of our culture out there and in the media space, you know, because I want I wanted to see that when I was younger. And I think that we can just do it on our own. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. Well, thanks for talking to me. Thanks for hanging out. Sure. Thanks for sharing. This was so much fun. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed speaking with you. All right. You too. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy this chat with Luisa. I'm so excited for the day that we can actually meet in person and maybe even collaborate and plan a trip to Mexico. Anyway, you can find all of her information on our website, elevatinglacultura.com. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please share, take a screenshot, send me a DM. You can also comment on our YouTube video. I always like to hear from people and how they resonated with the stories that I share. So, Enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, y nos vemos next week.